All right, so this is the warm-up to cover 1.3. Uh, a reminder that, let's say you get something similar to this on the test, it could be asking you to graph it, so you need your graphing calculator to graph it, and then answer the questions based on it. Okay, so make sure that you know how to do that. Obviously, I didn't give you an equation this time, it's just a picture. So it says to find f of one, so I wanna go to where the x is one, which is here, find the corresponding y, which would be good. And then find f of 2, so now I'm going to where x is 2, find the corresponding y, which would be 4. The next question is domain and range. So domain is my left to right. The fact that these lines get cut off by the outside of the graph implies what? Negative Good. These would keep going. My domain is going to be negative infinity to positive infinity. And the same for the range, bottom to top, negative infinity to positive infinity. If one of those stopped somewhere, obviously it would alter it. Number four says find the values of x for which f of x equals zero. Zero, zero. Zero, zero is one. Three, zero. So zero and three, good. Oh, okay. So because it just says find the values of x, you just have to give the x. If it asks for where the intercepts were, you'd give it in point form. Yeah. Oh, so it's just asking so, where, like what the values are when it touches zero. Right, remember that like it could ask for zeros, roots, X intercepts, where f of x is zero, all of those mean exactly the same thing. Because f of x is kind of saying y. Exactly. Would it be wrong if you put it in coordinates? Um, I don't know if I'd actually cost you the points. Just make sure that you'd have both zero, zero and three, zero. Yeah, that's okay. The other way around, I would probably take off points. So if it said, what are the x intercepts, I want it in point format. And if you just gave me a list of then, then I would probably take off points. But this, if, you, if you give too much information, I'm less inclined to take points off than if you don't get enough. All right, five says state which interval the graph is increasing or decreasing. And so remember that it says increasing, decreasing. Sometimes it'll say describe the increase and decreasing behavior, but it means include constants too. So this graph doesn't have a constant part, but if it did, you would make sure that you would include that as part of the behavior, okay? So it, it sometimes, most of the time actually, won't say increasing, decreasing, and constant, but it's implied. So I'm going from left to right on my increasing and decreasing behavior. This first path would be what? Decreasing. decreasing. So I could say it's decreasing from, and I'm doing the x values, right? So negative infinity good, negative, infin negative infinity to zero, zero gets a bracket or a parentheses. Parentheses. But you're doing the x values. So the only time you're going to do the y's are when it asks for the range, really. Everything else is going to be in terms of x values. All right, then the next shift goes from here to here, which is what? Increasing. Increasing. From zero to two. Good. Zero to two, parentheses on both, and then it goes back to decreasing. Because that point cannot be increasing or decreasing. So a point itself will never get a bracket if I'm describing it as increasing and decreasing. A point's a dot, right? It's not moving up. It's not moving down. The only time you're going to see a bracket on a point is if it's starting or stopping constant. So if my graph on all the way on the left starts constant or my graph all the way on the right stops constant. Those are the only times you're ever going to see a bracket on increasing, decreasing behavior. Okay, so we decrease back here from 2 to positive infinity. Only if it starts and stops constant. Sorry. So even if it's a constant point that's shared by a decreasing curve, I can't use a parenthesis there. I mean, I can't use a bracket there. So the one there. Right, so it would look like this. Say it's that, right? Mm -hmm. This section here, from here to here, would be constant. It starts constant, so that would get the bracket, whatever the number is here. And then this one would get a parenthesis because it stops being constant and starts being decreasing. And you can't have a point that's both constant and decreasing. So the only time you're going to get a bracket is if it starts or it stops. So we'll reverse this. Let's say it would look something like this. I don't know. Down and then stops here. So it's actually decreasing, 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 and then constant and ends constant with a bracket. Yeah, that's for all the yep. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah? Okay. 
All right, so then five says state all relative max or min values. So I've got a minimum here, right, a relative min, which is at zero, zero. And then a relative max here, good. Two, I have two to positive infinity. Yeah, oh, I just wrote them both under the decreasing. Yeah, so you don't have to separate them out. You can if you want to, but you don't have to. Any other questions in the warm up? Yep. So, like, for example, it's on the y, it's not at infinity. It's yep. For the range. Why, why is it a positive infinity? So for the range? Yeah, for the range. Because you're going from bottom all the way up to top, right? Okay. So, you always go in order of the, the, the value of the number, which means you start at the negative infinity and you always go up to positive infinity. Anytime you give it an interval notation, your order should be the same as the value of the number. So the smaller number comes first, biggest number comes second. And because the arrows are pointing down and up, you've got both negative infinity to positive infinity. Any questions on the homework that you're like maybe confused on in the homework? Does the domain range always have parentheses? No. Domain could have a bracket and a and a parentheses, or it could even have two brackets, right? If I just went from dot to dot. So Say that's your graph, right? That's a bracket to a bracket, domain and range. So it just depends where there's an arrow is a parentheses with an infinity or negative infinity. But if it's a solid dot, then it would be a bracket. If it was like an open dot, now my domain goes parentheses to bracket. How does going bracket That's increasing, decreasing behavior, not domain and range. Oh boy. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this said find the open intervals, which the function is increasing, decreasing constant, and um, if the answer doesn't, oh, that's the none. Okay, so increasing on this graph, right, is going to be from here to here, which is going to be from 2, and that's cut off, which means from positive to positive infinity, because it's going, right, as you move to the right, it's increasing. This would be decreasing. So go from negative infinity to negative 2. Both of those are going to get a parenthesis because increasing and decreasing can't have a bracket. Right? The point can't be increasing or decreasing. If it was solid across here, like let's say this went like this, that would be constant. And it would be from negative 2 to positive 2. But because those points are shared by another interval in which is increasing or decreasing, those also get parentheses. Correct. Or if there's an arrow. Uh, yeah, yeah, like if it stops ahead beforehand, but it has an arrow. Uh, All right, so you're good on the not function, right? The yeah. fails the vertical line test. So if I wanted to enter this equation into a graphing calculator, I've got to solve it for y. Otherwise, most of your graphing calculators, anyways, won't change to an x equals. So I just take that equation, x minus y squared equals 2. I'm going to subtract the x and then square root it. Actually, I have to multiply by negative 1 first. So that it goes positive y. And then square root it. But when you square root, you got to make sure you do the plus and minus. So it should have been plus and minus the square root of x minus 2 or negative 2 plus x if you wrote it the other way. Um, I mean, it depends on how, did you have the square root? Because the one you've got there doesn't have the square root. No, 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 like I tried it into square root. Okay. All right, so 1.4 is all about transforming graphs. So if you remember shifting graphs up, down, right, left, making them stretch vertically or shrunk vertically, okay, or horizontally, all that stuff is 1.4. So I, I would say 1.4 is an estimation of what graphs look like. Okay, a lot of these points are not going to be exact, but hopefully we can at least approximate what they look like. And this is really good for like standardized tests if you've got multiple choice um, on graphing. This saves you a lot of time. So common graphs to start with. A constant function would be an f of x equals a number. 
this is going to be a horizontal line. Think about your domain there would be negative infinity to positive infinity. The range is going to be a single number because the y never changes. And it is constant for the entire graph. So it would be constant from negative infinity to positive infinity. The f of x equals x is called an identity function. This is just like y equals x. So it's going to be a line that passes through 0, 0, and the slope's 1. So you're going to go up 1 and over 1, up 1, over 1. Okay? Domain, negative infinity to positive infinity. Range, negative infinity to positive infinity. And this time it's increasing the entire time. So we start basic and then we'll start to get a little bit more complicated. Absolute value, square root, quadratics, and cubic functions. So all of these are going to be part of what you'll be expected to transform. The absolute value is the v. The square root is obviously the square root. The quadratic would be an x squared. And the cubic function would be the x to the third. So you've got to know the basic shapes of these. These are called your parent functions. Okay? It's going to say, what's the graph of the parent function? And then what's the transformation? So am I shifting it to the right, to the left, up, down, narrow, wide, all that sort of stuff. So notice that this section is called the transforming functions, right? So what should be true about all these graphs? They're all going to pass the vertical line test. Okay? Otherwise, it's not a function. So you won't get a sideways V, okay, because God bless you, because that would fail the vertical line test and that would be the Y is an absolute value and you can't put F of X in absolute value, okay? So you're going to see F of X equals something and all of these graphs should pass your vertical line test. The cubic, I'm sorry, the cube root function almost looks like the, the square root pointing onto the right and then if you were to flip it over the origin pointing to the left. And then the last one is the reciprocal function. The parent function starts in the top right corner and the bottom left corner, or the first quadrant and the third quadrant. And this would be a 1 over x. So if you remember asymptotes, there's technically two asymptotes going on here, one here and one here where it wouldn't cross over those. OK, Ian? Why does it say odd function? Uh, oh, it's just that it is an odd function, odd. right? Because it would be symmetric to the origin. So would the cube root function, right? Those would both be odd. Yeah. To remind me to go over it, and I forgot. So good job. <coughs> Questions on either of those? So again, you want to memorize what the parent function looks like, and then we're going to figure out what happens when we start shifting these around. So a vertical shift, no matter what's going on with the x, Okay, that's going to be determined by your parent function. So the fact that it's absolute value means it's a V. The fact that it's a square root means it's the single arc going to the right. The squared is a parabola. The cubic function is the one that goes up on the right and down on the left, right? So that's telling you what is the actual parent function look like. If I add something after the function, so after the absolute value, outside of the square root, outside of the squared, or outside of the cubed, if I add, it's going to shift it up. And if I subtract, it's going to shift it down. I'll add in there f of x. So the cube root function could also be part of this. And the reciprocal function, it would be after the fraction. So if I'm adding or subtracting, I'm shifting up or down. Adding is up, subtracting is down. So the directions will say graph the function. Here I just gave you some square root ones, I mean some squared ones, okay, but you should get the general concept. If the first thing you should be saying is what does my initial graph look like? What's the parent function of f of x equal x squared? Parabola. It's a parabola. So if it asks you to describe it, you could either write a parabola or you could write a quadratic function, okay? If it asks you to draw it, you're going to draw your typical, just your u with your vertex being at 0, 0, okay? So if that's my, no, that's, well, I'm saying that's the parent function, right? And then if it said now shift it, right, what's going to happen is my graph is going to get shifted up one place. It's still a parabola, okay? So that's your end result would be shifted up one place. 
No, it'll just say graph. So I said, if it said graph the parent function and the shifted graph, then you'd have both of those. If it didn't say it, then I would just do the purple, the ending graph. Is that, that purple graph that's right there. Just graph it, okay? So what's gonna happen, you're eventually gonna see that, the horizontal stretch, and so I'm gonna compare it to your regular. Like, you're gonna label it for me if it's supposed to be stretched. So if it doesn't, which, like 10 seconds, you're just, not 10 seconds, but about a couple minutes. When it is stretched, you'll identify it as being stretched by literally writing like narrow or wide or stretched vertically or horizontally. And then that, I know the difference between your normal and someone else's stretched. You'll tell me when you intend for it to be different, okay? So your, your typical parent function, you don't need to write it. Okay. Or just shift it up or down, not until we start stretching it vertically, does it matter? You have to put it on one function. Correct. So that's the only exact point of my graph. Everything else would be an approximation. If I asked you to plot additional points, then I would plot to the right of the vertex, to the left of the vertex, and at least get a little bit of a curve. But for right now, we're just approximating. So what happens with B? Shift it down two places. So again, vertex would now be at zero, negative two. And it would be pointing up. Good so far. Yes, okay. Horizontal shift happens inside the function. So if it's inside the absolute value, underneath the square root, inside the parentheses, or in the fraction for the reciprocal function, so it would look like this if it was cubic. And it would look like that if it's a reciprocal function. And for this one, it's the opposite. So if you're adding, you're actually moving to the left. And if you're subtracting, you're moving to the right. So inside the function is a horizontal shift in the opposite direction. <coughs> All right, so again, we've got the same parent function. I just kind of kept the parabola, keep it simple. But inside those parentheses is a minus 2, which means what? Two I'm going 2 to the right. So I'm going over to 2, 0, and I'm making my parabola that points up. Obviously, they're going to start to do more than one thing at a time, right? So B has a plus 2 on the inside, which means what? Left 2. Left two. And then minus 3, which means down, down, down 3. So I don't care if you move left or down first, as long as you do both at some point. So I'm going to go left 2, down 3, and I'm going to plot a point. And then my parabola is going to point up. All right, then there's a reflection. So if the negative is on the front of the function, then it flips it across the x-axis. It flips it upside down. So my u would flip upside down. Okay, my v would flip upside down. My cubic function, instead of going up to the right, down to the left, would be up to the left, down to the right. And the square root would flip upside down. So instead of it pointing up and to the right, it would point down and to the right. If the negative is inside the function, then it flips it across the y-axis. So for a square root, instead of pointing to the right, it's going to be pointing to the left. And that's the case for all of Well, but most of them don't matter, right? Most of them, you flip a V, it looks the same, left to right. You flip a U, it looks the same, left to right. The ones it's going to impact are the cubic functions, the reciprocal functions, and the square root functions. So the same is going to be true for, although a negative. So the cubic square. Although they're the same, whether you're flipping it upside down or not. These are the ones that are going to flip across the y-axis. But again, whether it's a cubic with a negative on the front or on the inside, the cubic one looks the same, or the cubed one looks the same, because I can point it. So if my parent function square root, right, typically my square root function looks like this, oh, yeah. right? The square root with a negative on the front flips it so that it's upside down. Now I'm pointing 
down but to the right. And then a negative on the inside points it left. So up but left. And then if it was both places, it'd be down and left. Yep. It goes down and left here. Here's the best part. If you're unsure, what could you do? Graph it. Graph it. Plot a point, right? If I don't know if it's going up and to the right or if it's going down and to the left, plot a point. Okay? The idea is that transformations help you do it quicker. Okay? And it, but it is less precise. So if you are unsure, then just plot a point. All right. So looking at A, I've got a negative on the front. Well, first of all, the parent function is what? Square root, so it's going to look like this. That's what my parent function would look like. The negative on the front does what? Good. I say upside down because people start to mess up across the X, but it's definitely the more technical term. Upside down. The plus 1 on the inside does what? Uh, right. Left 1. So I'm moving left 1. I'm plotting a point. Typically, my graph would look like this, but it's flipped upside down. So it looks like that. For B, the negative is now on the inside, right? So it's going to point left. And the plus 3 after the square root means up 3. So I'm going to go up 3, plot a point, and point it left.